thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Robin Yap, and we have Michael Bach today. So, hello, Michael. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. So maybe um, you can let us know a little bit about yourself as well as CCDM. Sure. So I'm an Aquarius. I like long. No, that's a different conversation. <laughs> Um, I am the uh, founder and chair of the board of directors of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. I have been working in the field of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility for over 15 years, previously the head of diversity for KPMG in Canada. I was also the deputy chief diversity officer for KPMG International. And um, CCDI is an educational charity uh, with the mandate of educating Canadians on the value of diversity and inclusion, which is really lovely marketing speak. We work mostly with employers on how to create inclusive workplaces by providing them with educational opportunities in person and virtual uh, on a variety of topics. And I run our consulting arm, CCDI Consulting. Very exciting. And thank you for joining us in this you know, lovely day. And uh, so uh, first question is, you know, with what's happening in the world right now, um, what, what have you been seeing as like a trend that's been going on in the last year or so on the CCDI kind of a purview? Yeah, well, since May of last year, there has been an explosion in employers who are finally coming to the table around inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Um, it's massive. Uh, we are starting to see a bit of a peter out, a bit of a slow just degrade as other priorities kick in. Um, there's so much going on. I mean, people are trying to figure out back to work and what does that work like? And are we going back to the offices? And when is that happening? And oh, look, we're in lockdown again. And then, and, and, and. Um, so I, I can understand that there are a lot of competing priorities, um, which makes life very difficult uh, for employers trying to concentrate on this work. But certainly the first trend I would say is that people are just paying attention to it. The second is that people are paying attention to racism. And I will tell you that prior to George Floyd's death, we could not get a single employer to talk about racism, particularly here in Canada, where we're not racist. Canadians are not racist. That's total nonsense. We're just polite racists. We're very kind when we're oppressing people. Um, so nobody wanted to talk about it. And then George Floyd was killed and all of a sudden we're talking about it. So that's a big trend as well. We're hearing, you know, terms like anti-racism, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, anti-oppression in conversation around boardroom tables with CEOs. So that's exciting. The question will be, where does it go from here and how far do we get with that? And that's a, a big question. Thank you. And that, is indeed a, an interesting and big question and something that we can hopefully look forward to that is on a positive side of it. Now, when it comes to educating people, how do we ensure that we embed the idea of diversity, inclusion, equity into learning materials? What do we need to be cons considering constantly? Yeah. It, it's not enough to just say, okay, we put everyone through unconscious bias training and we're all good. Because of course, that's not how learning works. So I think it's a, there's a two-parter here. There's part to say, this is about ongoing learning constantly. Um, you know, there should be monthly training. And then that monthly training is further embedded with different learning mechanisms, micro learning, et cetera. Um, and because of things like turnover rates, you're just constantly in this cycle. I think the second piece of the puzzle is to look at all education, 
and look at it through an idea lens and say, is it inclusive? Is it representative of the student? Um, is it accessible? We, are, we went through a project recently with a, a textbook manufacturer where we were hired to review textbooks through the lens of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility to say, you know, are there more pictures of white people than there are people of color? Is the language accessible, et cetera? And these, I'm not talking about diversity textbooks, I'm talking about math textbooks and history textbooks. Um, and that's part of the process is we need to do a bit of a reset on all of it. I think we also have to understand that everything around us is designed from a position of colonialism. And people get really bent when I say this, but the reality is that we are a colonized country. 95% of people who call Canada home are from away. You know, my family has been on these lands for 200 plus years. I'm still a British mutt. And um, so we have to accept that we are in a position of colonization and our entire education system is about colonization. It's imported. So one of the keys to this is also looking at how do we decolonize our education system? How do we bring in indigenous practices? Um, how do we look at things through different lens? How do we um, dismantle some of this revisionist history that we have going on? So teaching children about residential schools and the treatment of indigenous peoples in an honest way. I think all of that together is about creating that truly inclusive world. Now, what do you say to um, hiring practices when you have potentially uh, much more qualified that Caucasian individual to somebody who may be of color and therefore the hiring is on, you know, of color rather than somebody who's actually more qualified. How, is there such a thing or what's happening there? Well, I think that does happen. Inevitably, mm -hmm. employers are doing that because they feel guilty. They feel like they have to. And I think it's a horrible practice. I think you have to hire the most qualified person. But, and there's always a but, um, there's a couple pieces to that puzzle. One, you have to look a little harder at your recruiting process to figure out if A, different candidates are applying for the job, and B, is there the potential for bias in the hiring process? So I'll give you an example. Let's say I put out a job and 50% of the applicants were men and 50% were women. And of those, let's say that 40% were people of color, making up numbers, doesn't matter. Throughout the process of application, screening, first interview, second interview, et cetera, statistically speaking, depending on the profession, it should be consistent. 50% men, 50% women, 40% people of color. If you get to the end slate of candidates, and let's say there's four, and it's all white men, a couple things could have happened. One, there's bias in the process. Or two, you're in a profession where the skill set is dramatically leaning towards one group. Long haul trucking, as an example, 3% women. So if you had 50% applicants from women, you're in a, that, that's a total imbalance. Nursing, 92% of nursing degrees go to women. So if you've got 50% men, again, there's an imbalance. But if you looked at accountants, lawyers, and you know, most sort of finance, financial professions, um, it's 50-50. And you, you have to be willing to dismantle that and break it apart and say, you know what? We've got some bias in our hiring process. The second piece of that puzzle is, are they applying? Do they know about the job? Are you known as an inclusive employer? And if you're not, then you have some work to do. When people say to me, oh, you know, we want to hire a woman for 
this board position or this senior executive position, but we can't find them. They're not hiding. Women have been graduating with more than 50% of undergraduate degrees since 1979. They're not hiding, but they're not applying or they're getting screened out. So you just have to be more deliberate in your process in order to get the diversification. Because to say that the only qualified candidate is a white man is not necessarily accurate. It's not always not accurate because let's face it, white men have had opportunity and therefore they may have more of the skills that you're looking for for the role. So there, there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle, but the advice I always give clients and I always will is that you must hire the best candidate. Now, what about layering technology in it? So now we have companies in the screening process use technology like AI to do a variety of things, anywhere from facial recognition, intonation pattern, to the actual screening of the candidates. What is it that we need to then ensure to the technology people programming the AI? Is it a similar uh, strategy that we need to incorporate? So there's two things you can do. One is make sure that the programmers are as diverse as possible, that they come from a really broad perspective. And the other is that you test your AI on the most diverse, broadest population. There are some notorious stories about AI that was built for um, and by white men. And um, I think about uh, voice recognition software that didn't work for women and didn't work for people who had accents. Um, I, think, uh, I think about um, one AI that was built from a talent attraction perspective um, and it um, was designed to find the best candidates and magically they were all white men. And when you looked at the programmers, they were all white men. So it's, it's, you have one of two, if not both choices and make sure that your programmers are diverse and your testing is diverse. Right. Ultimately, that should lead to an AI that doesn't have flaws because bias exists in all of us. And if you have bias as an individual, then that bias is gonna end up in your programming. Thank you. It's uh, interesting to actually, train people the fact that we actually all have these perspectives. Totally. And uh, that's, I think, a, a starting point for everyone and kind of go from there. Now, when it comes to um, our newcomers coming into the country, when their perspective might be a little bit different from what, you know, what we see as um, diversity and inclusion, how do we then train our newcomers who are in our workplaces? Is there a different way of approaching this? I, you know, I don't think that there needs to be a different way. I, I think the reality is that every time you bring a new person into an organization, you're bringing in all of their baggage. And if we look at it from the perspective of saying, well, people who are born in Canada will all have this perspective, that's not accurate. Um, so we have to assume that everyone is coming in with their own baggage, their own beliefs, their own biases. And so we teach everyone the same way. Newcomers bring their perspective. They bring their lived experience. Uh, we've seen that with newcomers in policing. People come from countries with very different relationships with policing. But we've also seen that with black communities born and raised in Canada have a very different relationship with police than I do. So I think it's, you know, this education is universal is really what I would say. And we don't necessarily need to do it different. I know some people would say, well, you know, people who come from Muslim countries and they have different beliefs about women's rights and that sort of thing. Is that to say that Christian 
Canadians are all in support of a woman's right to choose? No, that's not a thing. So, um, you know, everyone brings their own perspective and ultimately we have to, to teach them to be respectful. It can't be about changing their mind. I don't ever look at a conversation, you know, when I'm da- doing, say, LGBTQ2 plus training as a gay man. My objective is not to get everyone to dance on a pride float. My objective is to make sure that everyone in the room is going to be respectful of who I am as a person and who their colleagues are. It's, you know, it's not about convincing and changing minds. It's about finding a middle ground. Great, great way to uh, say that. That that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. So, what are your thoughts around um, the idea of belongingness? Because uh, it's not only you know diversity, inclusion, equity, and now there's this belongingness. Uh, do you agree with that terminology, or is there some other terminology we should be using? So, I've had some education on this. Um, originally, my instinct was yes. I want to feel like I belong. I want to feel like in going into an organization, I don't feel like I'm in the wrong place. Like I am the, you know, out of, out of my place. And I was speaking with some indigenous friends who said, I hate that term. I don't, I don't, I don't belong to anyone. And I thought, say what? (laughs) And I Googled as I'm apt to do a definition of the word belonging. And that is to be the possession of. And there's a lot of um, resistance to that term, particularly amongst um, communities that have, have experience with ownership, with slavery, black communities, indigenous communities, not just here in Canada, but around the world. Um, and I, I get that. It's, and this is the thing about language, right? We, we come up with a term and then, you know, the next thousand people respond to it and have a very different reaction. Um, I think it is important to be thinking about those, those ter- that terminology. I think the intent is right. The intention being that we want you to feel like you matter here. Um, it's just the use of that word belonging that oh. is getting. So what would be a better term? Oh, uh, um, I, I don't know that I have one. I mean, there's sort of like connection. It's about feeling like there's a connection to the employer. Um, and, and I don't know that that's the right term. Um, I, I, there are a variety of other terms like justice is thrown in. You see JEDI as an initialism or an acronym, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, um, now we're seeing belonging coming in, but that'll swing out as quickly as it swung in. Um, I, I don't know, it's that connectedness. It's that I matter. And so I don't the, know how to say that beyond I matter. I like that. And the terminology that I can come up with with that would be DICE. Diversity, inclusion, connections, and equity. Oh, I like that. So I think that's and you what just we're have to get using. the A in there for accessibility. DICE. Uh. <laughs> no, that, a DICE. We'll workshop it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what would you think? Uh, five years oh. or 2030 would look like in the world of DNI. Is that still going to be an issue or what should, is, what do you think would happen? So is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I had this crystal ball, I would be a very rich man. <laughs> um, is it still going to be an issue? Absolutely. Women's advancements we're what, 120 years into that conversation? Um, The civil rights movement, we're 60 plus years into that conversation. 
So yes, there's still going to be issues. What those issues are, anybody's guess. Um, like I said, before May 25th of 2020, racism didn't exist in Canada, according to a lot of people. Um, three years ago, we were not talking about the need for uh, pronouns in our email signatures and gender inclusive restrooms. And then things changed. So I honestly don't know. I hope I have my hopes, but the reality is that there is always a next. We often refer to the conversation around inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility as a, as a journey with no destination. And it is just keep moving forward and be prepared to evolve and adapt to what comes next because what comes next might completely mess things up. <laughs> um, and we still have to adapt to it. We still have to, you know, um, address it. Um, my hope, there I have hopes around women's advancement, around the advancement of people of color, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, but the reality is I don't know what the next corner is gonna face. Okay, so thank you so much, Michael, for joining us this morning and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me. All right.